Prime Minister Lee, thank you for hosting us. Add to Mike's thanks. Uh, we will try to add some humour amongst the seriousness, but normally, as you know, we begin these conversations uh, with the Cold War between China and America. But this time we have two hot wars going on. We have Hamas and Israel, and we have Russia's with Ukraine. So can we begin first with, with Hamas and Israel? On October the 7th, you spoke out loudly to condemn what Hamas did then. Since then, as the bombing of Gaza has, in, has continued, you have called for a truce or a ceasefire. You have added things about maybe there's a need to investigate um, possible war crimes. You have talked about the need to refresh the two-state solution. This is a slightly different position to America. I wonder if you could unpack for us how you ended up in that position. Well, we have to take a principled position considering our national interests and considering also the sentiments and the human reactions of our people. And the principle is that borders are inviolate, people, countries have the right of self-defense and killing of innocent civilians, women, children, old folks or any other civilian is against international humanitarian law. And what happened on the 7th of October was not just against international law, but a horrendous terrorist attack on an enormous scale. So we fully understand how the Israelis feel about it uh, and why they have reacted the way they have done. But what has happened since then in Gaza as a consequence of Israeli operations is an enormous human tragedy. I mean, it's, the numbers are, keep on ticking up every day, but as many times as many as uh, what happened on the 7th of October. Again, women, children, and many innocent civilians, the destruction is on an enormous scale. And everybody around the world looks at this and in despair and says, surely this has to stop. Whatever the rights and wrongs, you must pay attention to the humanitarian considerations. And we have tried to express that in our statements. I think it's important that we recognize both the, the evil things which are done in the, in the first attack on the 7th of October, and also the very, very tragic things which are happening in Gaza now. And you have to be quite, we have to exhort the Israelis and everybody else to abide by international norms and to have a consideration for innocent civilians. Do you think there is a long-term solution? You've always been a supporter of the two-state solution. Is that still possible? There is no alternative to that. It's very difficult. It looks way over the horizon. But the alternative to a two-state solution is a one-state solution. And that means one side or the other has to be squeezed out. And that is unimaginable. So if you can't work towards a two-state solution, you are going to be in this cycle of um, mutual destruction for generations to come. Do you worry about security in this region? I mean, next door you have in Malaysia, you have uh, Anwar Ibrahim. You know, he has come up quite vocally in support of the Palestinians. There is, I think some people worry, I see you've taken some precautions about more terrorism in this region because of the Israel Hamas. I, I think diplomatic positions is one thing, and some countries support Palestine, some countries support Israel. Singapore has diplomatic relations with Israel, and we also have friendly relations with the Palestinian Authority. So diplomatic support is not the difficulty, but terrorism is a danger. And you've seen lone wolf isolated attacks in Europe, in France, and I think in Belgium somewhere. Yes. Uh, there was an attack, an innocent Palestinian boy got killed in America. It can happen in this part of the world. We've had self-radicalized individuals in Singapore we've picked up, including teenagers who wanted to do terrible things and had gone and bought bulletproof vests and knives and uh, practice. And some of them wanted to uh, fight in the Middle East on behalf of ISIS. Some of them wanted to emulate the Christchurch uh, terrorists and um, uh, 
attack Muslims in Singapore, mm. in two mosques. So, and there are still terrorist groups within the region who have not disappeared. Uh, the Jama'a Islamiyah who are affiliated with Al-Qaeda and who, whom we picked up in Singapore before they were about to do seven truck bomb attacks in Singapore, still exist. And they are, and they are watching and some of their followers uh, will sure to surely be riled up and they may plan something. So we have to take it very seriously. You, you called, you're in favour of a ceasefire in Gaza. Yeah. When do you think we will get one in Ukraine? And, and do you worry at the moment that Russia is winning? I, I think Ukraine is going to be a long fight and it's going to be a very difficult fight because Russia is not going to declare that they have lost. And it's also for Ukraine with its resources and even all the support from Europe and from the US to be able to keep on fighting and keep it up. You can replenish your guns and your, and your shells and your aeroplanes and tanks, but the human deaths, the casualties, and it, it can go on, but it cannot go on forever. So I think Russia has already failed in its objective of overcoming Ukraine. And that's a great plus for the world because if they had actually been able to launch a sudden overwhelming and successful takeover, and then there's a new border, uh, then I think the world would have been much the more dangerous place. But the fact that they have failed, that they are paying a terrible cost, that's a plus. But where will it end? And for how long can Ukraine supporters keep it up? And how will the moods change in America? With this administration, I think you know where President Biden stands, but elections are due next year. We, we will come back to that, but just one quick question on Ukraine. Do you think that is what you described as this horrific experience for Russia? Do you think that has changed the thinking in China about potentially going into Taiwan? I, I don't think the Chinese would ever have thought lightly about going into Taiwan. They must surely know, and they have soldiers and sailors and airmen who will advise them that uh, an amphibious attack, attacking Taiwan is not like doing Iwo Jima, and Iwo Jima was bloody enough. So I'm sure they must make the calculations, but I don't believe that uh, they are trigger happy. Uh, they, they have a problem, they would like Taiwan to be part of one China, but how to get from here to there? And I believe if they are not provoked, if events don't spin out of control, I don't believe that they are going to, you're going to wake up one day and find that they've decided uh, to launch D-Day. Are you more worried at the moment, I was struck coming to this region, is that yes, there's still talk about Taiwan, but there's also talk about the Philippines a bit. In the South China Sea, you have President Marcos being quite aggressive with China. They are a treaty ally of the United States. And surely that, is, that, that, that would be that, very that's difficult. That's another possible flashpoint because um, all the, or four, South, four ASEAN countries have claims in the South China Sea which overlap with Chinese claims. Uh, Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, Vietnam. Mm. Um, all of them want to work some arrangement out with, between themselves in the first place and with China uh, mostest because China is really the biggest claimant and most muscular. But at the same time, all of them have got other stakes with China. They are trading with China. China is their biggest uh, trading partner, I think, for all of them. And Therefore, this is not South, the South China Sea is important, but it is not the only thing at stake. Mm. And I do not believe that any of them really, truly want to push it over the brink. But nobody ever does on the whole. Putin. Uh, nobody Putin. ever does on the whole. But I would say that in this, in the case of the Southeast Asian countries, their awareness of what the what the Soviets used to be called the correlation of forces. Yes. In other words, who's on your side and who was on my side and whose battalions are bigger. I think there's a very healthy sense of realism 
and therefore some restraints will be there. And even the Filipinos, I mean, the Americans are their treaty ally, but are you sure you want to get into a fight where you, you will be the battleground? Within China, the China you're talking about seems to be one that is getting more realistic, that, it, that, that Xi Jinping is thinking harder, that he's prepared to play a kind of more long-term role. Is that the way you look at it? I think China wants to grow. China is determined to develop. And they believe, I think rightly, that they will get there one way or the other, sooner or later. You can hold them back a few years. Uh, you can deny them technology. They will develop their own. It may not be as good, but they will have something. And they are determined to show their people and show the world that it can be done. Challenges, how do they do this and feel pride in themselves, at the same time inspiring confidence and um, a certain tranquility amongst the rest of the world. <laughs> and that's very hard because you may think you are doing nothing very unreasonable and these are your rights and countries big and small are entitled to do the same things. But when a small country does a certain thing, other, the others can say, well, that's all right. I mean, no harm done. But when a big country makes the same kind of action, you can cause reverberations everywhere without quite realizing it. And I think that it will take a while to get the right feel to, for, for the Chinese to be able to grow taller and stronger and yet keep everybody on side and on good terms. I think they are trying. You see the Australian Prime Minister Albanese it's been uh, with whom they've had some um, the difficult moments recent, in recent years, is, has been in uh, China. And they are, both sides want to move forward and want to have a relationship. They know that Australia is a U US ally. They are buying American nuclear subs. But they still need a relationship. But this new mature, the interesting thing is this new mature China, which perhaps is slightly more different to how you and I began. No, I'm not sure that it's for us to judge whether they are mature or not. They are in a different phase. I'm a journalist. I'm allowed to. Well, do this. You, you, you are allowed to use words, but I have to use my own. <laughs> <laughs> But this new, mature, this new mature China, or whatever you want to call it, is now about Joe Biden is about to go and meet Xi Jinping in San Francisco. And that, I, that, is, that is the core of this relationship. No, that's, the that is a necessary step in this difficult moment in the relationship. They met last year in Bali. It was a good meeting. They agreed on some principles that they would uh, respect each other. They would cooperate. It would be win-win. Uh, but after that, in 12 months, in fact less than that, events happened and things went off track. And they're trying to put it back on track again. And I think there's a lot of toing and froing to tee it up so that the meeting can take place and uh, be productive. But I think that this is a very deep contradiction between the two countries. And you need a meeting to head in the right direction, but you do not expect a meeting to uh, make everything sweetness and light again. It's not possible. Surely then you're going to end up with the same as last time we may get a deal on fentanyl, say, or something like that, but you'll be back. Your, your foreign minister put it very well in our conference today. The weather may get better, but the climate, if you think of all the conversations you and I have had, the climate has continued to get worse and worse. I think that climate is very difficult. On both sides, uh, very entrenched views have taken root. In, in America, there's the only thing that uh, the two parties agree on is that China is a grave threat. Mm. And in China, there's also a very strong consensus that America is out to block them and uh, is not, it, it's difficult to coexist with America and that you shouldn't try, you should, you should prepare to protect yourself against America. So when you have this such views on both sides, even to want to think about stretching out and talking about a more constructive future is difficult. Another imponderable in that is the American election. I noticed that you just announced, as Mike said, you announced that next year you would, you would 
give over to Lawrence Wong just before the party's 70th anniversary. No, I didn't say just before. I said by the time by of. The time. But that is, as you know, as you know that, is, that, is, <laughs> that is in November, which is also, curiously, the date of the American election. And if we look at the polls now, a man called Donald Trump is ahead. Yes. Did you, did you look and think, oh, God, not him again? I'll hand him over to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was not my principal consideration. <laughs> But is it an additional incentive to... <laughs> no, the, the world is a difficult place. I mean, whether I hand over next year or in five years' time, there will be things outstanding and there will be uh, clouds on the horizon. And this just happens to be the, most, the one which is closest to you and most prominent. But a Trump election would, in this way, it would put, I think, more pressure on China to be the kind of grown-up in the room, which I know you've, I, you've wanted I them to be. I don't know. I think... Well, Trump took actions which Biden didn't reverse. For example, imposed tariffs on Chinese mm. products and um, generally made the relationship much less predictable. Biden's approach is much more predictable, but on China, he has not reversed what Trump did. And I think his attitudes are also quite firm, a feeling that you, you, you don't want to clash but neither is he going to give way on things which he feels very strongly about. And if you go back to Mr. Trump in his previous, as he was the previous time, I suppose that gives you some idea of his approach to foreign policy. But uh, it's a long game, and four years is a long time in politics, but not a long time in the history of uh, the relations between two great powers. So even if in America, you are preoccupied with things other than uh, the most important bilateral relationship in the world. On the other side, and in the rest of the world, this should still be a major preoccupation, and hopefully there will be the perspective and the equanimity and the, the, the reach to say, my partner is in a difficult moment. Let's see how I can manage this without giving anything away, but neither doing anything worse. That sounds a bit like being the grown-up in the room, but is there, now a, is there now a third figure, which is India? I think India is growing rapidly. Last year, they were one of the fastest-growing countries in the world. Uh, and Mr. Modi, with his uh, economic reforms and his uh, drive towards digitalization, uh, is making progress, getting India to move up another level, but it's a distance because the Indian economy is one-fifth the Chinese, their international trade is about one-fifth mm -hmm. the Chinese. Uh, their population is younger and still growing, unlike the Chinese one, which is older and already stable and beginning to come down. But they have to make the most of it and they have to extend that reach beyond the subcontinent to influence East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the wider world. And I, I think they are, you can see the, that they are starting to do that with uh, the Quad. Uh, but I don't think that they have put quite as much resources into uh, the wider game beyond the subcontinent. Right, they're behind China in that respect. They're not looking at a, a kind of global system through a... I think also their system is not as amenable to the Chinese system if, if they decide to do a Belt and Road, for example. Yes. I don't think they'd be able to say, OK, I want to invest in infrastructure, and then suddenly you find ports, roads, airports, trains sprouting up all over the region, which is for the good and maybe for the bad. Can you tell me, I mean, we've talked about Singapore through your... Your, your, your time here, it's been, you've been in the middle of the America-China one. The other one, you, you are the great symbol of globalization. Just to, you, you, and yet you see during all these conversations we've had, every year the world has felt more regional and less global. I mentioned Trump. Trump has now said that if he comes in, he's going to put 10% tariffs on everything. Is it, that, surely that will be the end of the global age, if not, if it hasn't Well, already. it's trending in not in a favorable direction, and <laughs> even without Trump, the Industrial Relations Act, you, you're, you're, you're making industrial policy, you're 
deciding to do chips, you're deciding to do green technology, but basically you're deciding that we need to make rules for ourselves and not depend on rules which are negotiated multilaterally. And if we're talking about the rules-based order, it becomes difficult to understand exactly how the rules are being made. And if everybody takes that approach, then in effect, there will not be any rules and we will all be in difficulty. I think the Europeans have made that point uh, quite forcefully. Can I ask you about something which um, is one of those areas where people do want rules? AI. I mean, I looked it up. You were the first, what you call a senior wrangler. You were the first person to get top maths marks at Cambridge University, which Mike didn't mention. I didn't sadly get that at Oxford. But you were the first person to get that from Singapore. So you understand maths. And I suppose the basic question to you is, do you think AI is a bigger change than the internet? Well, the first thing you must know is that there are a lot of things you don't know. <laughs> and on AI, most of us don't know where it is going. I don't think even the researchers know where it's going. And I don't pretend to understand how the technology works. I have a vague idea of the principles, but I don't understand how they've made all these magical consequences happen. And I'm not, I do not know how far the present approach can go. It took 50, 70 years from the time the idea of AI came about and people started inventing computer languages like Lisp to be used for AI programming to chat GPT. 1950s until now is an enormous long, dis long duration. And all along that, dura or that path, the thought was we are about to make a breakthrough, which eventually did come. Now you, are think you're, now you think you're on the run, but will it go all the way to the point when you can have a conversation and either the chatbot can interview me or I may interview the chatbot? Or I could interview the chatbot. Or two chatbots may be talking to each other better than us. <laughs> and we don't know. It could go there just by putting in 10 times more chips and 10 times more computing. It could be you reach a limit and then you need another breakthrough conceptually to take it to the next level where it's got insight, understanding, judgment, reasoning, and empathy. But I think in principle, there's no reason why you can't build a machine which can think, act, speak, maybe possibly look like it is feeling like a human being. Some philosophers think it's not possible. I don't, I don't believe that. I think it is possible, but I don't know how long it will take. I do know that if it does, when it does happen, uh, we will have very profound questions to answer. And they will be very difficult to answer because if it is as smart as you, you will not be able to pre-program it to be stupid enough to be killed. <laughs> right? That's a fundamental contradiction. I mean, you think that you can make a special push button somewhere, I press it and it will suddenly uh, say yes sir, and obey you. But if it is really that smart, uh, you will have not thought of all of the consequences. But in that sort of technological balance of power, do you sense that America is a long way ahead of China or do you think it's... I think r right now they are ahead, both because of the tech, they make the chips, also because they attract so much of human talent. And uh, I mean, even Asian, Chinese, Indian researchers, they are in, in America making breakthroughs. And also because of their uh, free enterprise system. I mean, Silicon Valley, you may have your views about the tech companies, but they, have, they are able to take an idea and use it to transform the world for better or for worse. And now here we have something which is happening, already making an impact on the world, not to become a super cyborg, but just to be your AI assistant to help you draft a paragraph or to write a short note. And uh, we need to gain experience operating with it and understanding what the pitfalls are so that we can make smart decisions to regulate it as we go along. Right now, I can safely say that in the government, in my government, and I think in most governments, uh, the tech people know more about this than the government people. It's inherent in the way the, the the breakthroughs are happening. We are not the ones making the breakthroughs. The people who are doing that are in the universities, are in the uh, uh, companies, 
and they know much more about it than us. Some of them are worried, and I think there's reason for us to pay attention. Can I ask you quickly about S Singapore and then about yourself at the end? On, on Singapore, it's, it's been a slightly tougher year than normal for Singapore. You had this, the money laundering thing with some Chinese business people. You even had one or two officials in the government be, not being pulled into that, but being probed and so on, and which I know compared with certain southern European countries would not really worried. No, the we don't compare ourselves with certain southern European countries. <laughs> <laughs> Not even with any northern European country. Well, that would be. We just want to maintain high standards, and when the standards fall short, uh, we have to deal with it. And once in a while, you'll find that one of your own didn't quite uh, live up to what he should have done, or appears to have done something not quite right. And well, we have to do the right thing, and we'll have to be seen that the right thing is done, which is currently underway. I don't think the Chinese money laundering case is in any way a scandal for us. It's a criminal case. Um, criminals do bad things. We find out, we investigate it, we do what we need to do. We seize the money, the cars, the handbags and everything else. And then we charge them in court and they have to prove that uh, <laughs> these are things which they legitimately own. They didn't, they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, but. As far as my system is concerned, the system is clean, the system did what it was supposed to do, and it will keep itself clean. If my system had been corrupted... Then you'd be in trouble. Then I'm in trouble. Then you'd be back in the European levels. But <laughs> I, I, I don't know what levels the Europeans are at. Can I ask, can I ask you a bit, as, as you pointed out, and Mike pointed out, you, know, you are next year, sometime, sometime for the PAP's 70th anniversary, you're going to hand over to Lawrence Wong. So you will have done... 20 years by then, and I wondered uh, yeah. how, much you, how much you think what's changed during that. I mean, if you look at your father, your father came in famously as a socialist and ended up as a Thatcherite. I've been wandering around Singapore at the moment, and there are all these big programs to hand out more money to people in retirement, fight off inflation. <laughs> have you been drifting to the left? Uh, we have been sailing carefully to a more comfortable place. <laughs> no, it, w when the economy is growing and all boats are lifted by the tide, uh, we can afford to be and we need to be very rigorous in how we help those who are not quite catching up. You can tell them, run faster, work harder, here's a bit more incentive, <laughs> go ahead. And mostly it works very well. And we, we, we did that for a very long time. But over time, as the race goes on, as, as the field spreads out, and some are further forward and some are not quite so far ahead, and then their kids are not so far ahead, you have to think, how are you going to hold this team together? And when sometimes somebody who's doing perfectly well, the world changes on him, and suddenly the, last, the first shall be last, well, what do you do? Do you say that's just the, world, the way the world is? Or is there something, something I can do to help him get back into the race again and be contrib contrib contributing again? And I think that we are in a phase where we have to do more together, where we have to help each other, and the government has to be there, and we have to try very hard to avoid the government being the sole solution to all problems. So the government is not going to get massively bigger, but it'll get a bit bigger. We are, we are the, probably the smallest government in the, uh, in the developed countries because we spend about less than 20% of the GDP. That's the government budget. My government budget is about the same percentage of the GDP as some European countries spend on state pensions. Hmm. I mean, it, your system is different, but we've kept ours very lean. And we need to keep it very lean, but the pressures of aging, of higher healthcare costs, of higher social needs are pushing us up gradually. And our challenge is how do we fund that and how do we allow that to happen where necessary without just you know, blowing up out of control. And that means from time to time uttering the forbidden word, taxes. <laughs> And we are in the middle of doing that now. We have a goods and services tax, like a VAT. We, it was 7%. We pushed it up to 8 in the, on the 1st of January this year. 
and is about to go up to nine on the 1st of January next year. And uh, we will make it happen, but what we are doing is to provide quite generous, practically cash subsidies to the lower two-thirds of the population so that I can get the system through. I'm in a new place in terms of my revenues, but as far as impact on the households, that's deferred for quite some time. What would, how, would, how would you like to be remembered? What, do you, what, what is the bit that... What, what is the bit out of that? Do you, do you want to be seen the person who kept seeing No, I, I think I just focus on doing my job. I'm not into, uh, uh, what do they? Eulogies. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> but you have... I, I'm not into the point where I sit down and talk about what I used to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings me to my last question. You, there is talk of, you, talk of you becoming senior minister. When I first met you many years ago, you had just taken over as prime minister. And then I went to go and see your father, who supposedly had semi-retired to be senior minister. And I discovered, to my slight surprise, he was living above your cabinet room, which struck me as being No, no, he's not living the, there. He was, he was working sorry, there. He was working there, so he's working there. <laughs> but that would, if I was running a cabinet meeting and he was up there, I mean, are you going to planning that degree? No, it, it didn't happen. I was running the cabinet meeting and he was in the cabinet room. Yes. <laughs> but he's still somewhat close. It, it worked quite well. <laughs> my predecessor was in the cabinet room too, so I had two of my predecessors in the meeting. And one of my fellow prime ministers said to me, I can't imagine what your cabinet meetings are like. Does this but they right? work. It worked. Uh, you, it's a very delicate thing to be overwatching, but not overbearing. And to be able to give advice and a helpful nudge and just the right wise word and not cram the style of your successor. I'm at the disposal of my successor. I've already said whatever he wants me to do, I will do to help him succeed. So you have to ask him what he will be doing with me. Well, Prime Minister Lee, I hope we see you next year as well. No, I shall be in the audience listening to you. <laughs> listening from up above. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Come on this way.